recently the Elden Ring trailer came out and there were some previews and it looks fantastic it looks amazing I can't wait to get involved and figure out the game but when I was going through the trailer I couldn't help noticing some really cool details which I think would work well in a D&D setting so I thought I'd do a list of the 10 coolest things to take away from the Elden Ring trailer you can use in your D&D campaign the first thing I want to point out is the map when you get a map, you have to start unlocking pieces, collecting pieces as you go. And this helps open it up as a, it looks like an open world game. But the best thing is, there's not a lot of detail in the map. But you're allowed to put different markings and scout the map for yourself. And this makes it feel more organic. It feels like you're a cartographer. And if you can try and incorporate that into a game of D&D by providing the players with a lightly detailed map, and giving them the freedom to try and explore and mark different places. I think that's a really interactive way to get the players involved and invested in the geography of the world. Another aspect of the map is the verticality. When you're riding your horse around the map in Elden Ring, it looks like there's these waypoints called Spurt Springs, where you can go on top of them and they'll shoot you up the side of a mountain. Now I'm sure there's some in-law logic behind it, but being able to traverse up and down uh, large cliff faces is a pretty cool concept. And if you try and work this into your game, it will give more context to the structure of the map. Also, there was some really cool lightning weather techniques. And I think that weather is an underutilized part of world building. Uh, it really adds to the atmosphere. If you say it's a dark and stormy night, that's a bit generic. But if you go into detail about how the wind has wept tree down and there's a small fire from a lightning strike, you can give the players a sense of danger when they're entering these places. The second thing I noticed was the orchestral score. There was lots of choirs, there was lots of echoes, and it really builds up the tension of the game. And I think if you can use this in your D&D setting, then check out the old Dark Souls or the Sekiro soundtrack, or even go to Bloodborne. That has a fantastic soundtrack. There was also some really small but significant details. For example, on top of this church, there is... Uh, looks like it's been abandoned for a long time, so there's patches of grass growing up from the roof of the church. And that's the sort of small details that can really hook the players in. The third thing I noticed was the NPCs. They're all a little bit strange and there's something off about them, but they're very memorable. Instead of having a generic uh, bartender in a tavern, you, you can go the other route and find an encounter with Alexander the Iron Fist, which is a, like a giant pot with arms. It's gone full Bennett Foddy with this, and uh, you have to use a giant axe to try and lodge him out of uh, his quagmire. I don't know, he's stuck in like a piece of the ground. But it's those little bits of details that really bring the characters to life and make them memorable. And of course, it's no Dark Souls game without a waifu. The next part I wanted to bring up was gathering components and crafting the system. There's going to be an open world crafting system where you collect ingredients similar to The Witcher. But to bring this into your game, you can let the players search around for ingredients and even if they don't have proficiency, let them try to make a potion. It can be something as mundane as something that heals 1d4 damage, or it can be something that can add 1d6 lightning damage to your attacks for the next 30 seconds. But giving the players the ability to craft potions and the idea of crafting something unknown is quite mysterious to them. It can be a great way to get the players hooked in and interested. The next thing I noticed, there was stealth sections. Now, there was a, an example of a, like an encampment where there were bandits going around and of course it was night time and they had uh, the ability to scout ahead. There was a caravan with some hidden treasure in it as well, but... My idea is that if you're going to have a stealthy section, you can always give all of the players a reason to be stealthy. This can be an extra 1d6 on attacks, like a mini sneak attack, or it can be something like gathering intel and letting the players have the opportunity for stealth attacks, which could lead to extra bonuses. A good example from the Hitman games is you start off stealthy, you always try and sneak your way in, and then halfway through it all goes wrong, and you end up having to fight your way out, which happens with a lot of stealth sections, but the idea is very enticing to get through the section from start to finish without making a noise. Now, if you want to get an Elden Ring or Dark Souls style game on D&D, I think I would recommend having like three players at the most. Try to keep the party size as small as possible, so you can train to balance the encounters to be more personal. Also, there's a cool article I read recently about the five room dungeon idea, and I'll leave the link down below, or you can see it underneath here. But uh, I would highly recommend you check it out. I think it's a great way to structure 
a one shot or a short session but at the same time if you let the players find out by chance then this can lead to them feeling like there is an open world and there's tons of possibilities out there the next thing i noticed was that there was multiple routes multiple ways of doing things there was not just one way of fixing the problem and in Elden Ring, I think that uh, allows you to open shortcuts, but in a D&D setting, if you tr give a safe option, then you give a high risk, high reward option, it can give the players a little bit of a moral dilemma to go through. And at the end of the trailer, there was a stunning boss battle. It's like a giant armored guy with like multiple arms on these sides. And then when he got to the second phase, there was a giant dragon's head. He's ripped off a wall and he's using that to shoot fire at the player. Now to put this into perspective, when you're creating a boss battle or a big bad evil guy fight, you should try and consider the surroundings as well. It's not just about having the guy appear and then cast some spells. The more unique actions you can give him, or phases you can give him, it can lead to really memorable encounters. For example, the first phase he's fighting with a sword, the second phase he pulls the dragon head off the wall and he starts shooting the equivalent of uh, burning hands at the players, then that's going to be an epic set piece. And the next thing, much like a lot of the From Software games, not all enemies are supposed to be attacked head on. Some sections you can stealth past the enemies because if you try to take them on in combat they're just going to wipe you with one hit. But planting the seed in the player's mind that there are powerful creatures out there that they shouldn't mess with gives a larger scale and larger context to the world. It's not just everybody that's on the same level as the players but there's multiple different tiers out there and if they're interested and they're excited then they'll want to explore these in the future. The other thing I noticed uh, is the return of secret walls or illusionary walls. Now this can be frustrating for the players if you don't drop hints to them, but always have uh, an easter egg in every map you have. It can give a reason for the players to explore the area before they end up getting into combat. If you'd like to help support the channel, I have six subclasses available on the Patreon and I'm updating with a new subclass every month and it's going to keep continuing as far as it can go but i wanted to give something back to you guys because a lot of patreons it's just you can get a shout out at the end and that's, that's all good and well but i wanted to physically give you something that felt rewarding so there are some cool subclasses up there this includes a mentor fighter which you can get for free there's a dragon patron warlock a pixie sorcerer and a herbalist ranger which is really cool also the newest one is the Saboteur Rogue. Uh, it lets you throw bombs that can cause area of effect sneak attack damage, which is a, a great way to mesh the two mechanics together. Anyway, I've been talking for too long. My name is Rich and I'll catch you next time. Bye.